Well, welcome back to the final uh, video in the Change Tempo Leadership Insights discussion, which is all about diversity today. And I have the pleasure of meeting with Phil Baker, who is co-founder and MD of 30,000 Days Limited and an executive coach. Phil was also former MD at Cisco, championing diversity. And Phil is gonna share with us today his personal journey around diversity, which culminated in him leading a diversity group called Men for Inclusion across Europe. So welcome, Phil. As I said, it's such a pleasure to have you join us. Why don't you say more about who you are and what you do as some context for our discussion today? Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Thanks for uh, thanks for thinking of me for this uh, for this topic. Um, it's a pleasure. So, so as you say, yes, I um, uh, was a, an MD at Cisco for a number of years. Um, and as a very inclusive and diverse organization, I was fortunate enough to be part of a number of initiatives whilst I was there. So I think there's definitely a journey that I've been on, uh, Amanda, to to help me understand and to, to embrace diversity, but also as a leader to create the right inclusive environment for my team. I, I think that that was a very big part of, of, of my journey at Cisco. And then, as you said, subsequently, uh, I've, I've, I've now set up my own business. And a big part of that business is around how do you drive a great culture? You know, how do you drive people to excel? And there is an absolute correlation between companies that do really, really well, that drive great results, that attract, you know, top talent and retain top talent. There's absolutely a link between those companies mm -hmm. and having an inclusive environment and inclusive culture that thrives. So, yeah, no, it's definitely been a big part of my journey and, and even more so now in my new business venture. Wonderful. Wonderful. I really liked how you picked out that connection between culture and diversity inclusion. <laughs> so how come you are so passionate about diversity, Phil? What, what is it that sparks you or what was it that sparked you? to to really focus on this or to have a such a wonderful opinion about it yeah i mean that is a good question in fact i get asked that a lot um i think and also somebody told me once you know whatever you do don't say you're passionate now because you have two daughters it's like right. before i didn't care about diversity but now i have two <laughs> daughters so therefore i now care about it i mean it, it's not it, luckily it's not linked to that um I think it was, you know, my own journey. I mean, I'd say I was raised well. You know, my parents didn't raise me to be ageist, racist, sexist, or, or, or anyist. So I always thought that actually, you know, the world's a good place. You know, I, I wasn't brought up in an area or, or in an environment where I saw any ism. And, mm. um, and then when you join the sort of the corporate world, again, you know, I worked with some great people and thought, you know, everything's fine and i think as companies started to evolve and realized that actually diversity is not equal when you look at statistics you know just just simple diversity you know male female ratio in in, in, uh, in companies today it's far from being equal i mean it's you know in the 20 to 30 percent um for, for some companies just how many women there are versus men so clearly it, it, it's not equal but what i think helped me get a bigger picture is I always thought, well, look, I'm, I'm a great leader and I'm not ageist, racist, sexist, or as I said before, and look, Hey, do you know what? I've got a, I've got a woman in my team. So, Hey, I mean, I'm a great diverse leader. It's, it's all those other leaders that you need to speak to and kind of just thought that, well, there isn't really a problem. And then as I started working with more diverse groups, particularly at Cisco, I started to, sh started to share and understand stories that, it kind of blew my mind and actually I started to then think well maybe maybe I don't really know what it's like and what I mean by that is do I know what it's like to be a woman no as you can see I'm not a woman you know do I know what it's like to be black or Latino or Asian or a veteran or you know no I don't so you know for me learning from others learning in those inclusive uh, environments that I had the fortunate uh, opportunity to be in has really opened my mind and as always being a people person, I always wanted to drive a great team, great passion, great energy. I realized that I wouldn't be able to successfully do that if I didn't create the right environment for an inclusive 
an inclusive team. So that, that's kind of what uh, drove me to be so passionate. Nice. And, um, you know, with this segment of these discussions, it would have been so easy for me to have, <clears throat> you know, got somebody else to talk about diversity, a black and Asian woman, disabled, whatever. But I think, you know, putting the elephant on the table here, Phil, if I may say, and I know you've been, you've given me permission to say this as a middle-aged white man, <laughs> are you really the right guy to talk about diversity? And, and I think you are, you know, I think it's coming from the perspective that, 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 that you have, that you can almost talk or represent, you know, the perspectives of the middle-aged white man or any white person that might be trying to grapple and understand how they can have a dialogue or, or, or approach a conversation about it. So I know that was a long question. So yeah, are no, you good, the right person to talk about this? <laughs> it's a good question. And I'm glad you put the elephant in the room on the table because yeah, I mean, if, if, you know, for the people watching this video, you're probably sat there thinking, really, you know, I'm going to watch yeah. this middle-aged white guy spout on about diversity for the next 15 minutes. Uh, well, what does he know? And, and it's a, it's a really good question. So, um, <clears throat> What I would say is, particularly in the corporate space, when you look at the majority, the majority today for so many companies generally is, is men. And in fact, you know, if we start narrowing it down, it's generally white men make up the majority mm -hmm. for a lot of companies today. An interesting statistic that I learned is 70% of men do not feel part of any diversity conversations. In fact, if you go far enough back when you look at when organizations first started to think about diversity it was perhaps 20 years ago where companies you know were being sued for being discriminatory or, or for behavior of some of the male employees so 20 years ago it was much of hey everybody everybody treat everyone equal don't say this word don't say that word don't do this don't do that it was a very very you know you must manage within the law i mean that mm -hmm. was how people were taught so 20 years ago so if you take that and then you take that, that men generally don't feel part of the diversity conversation, or at least 70% don't, to really move the needle okay, across the broad spectrum of diversity, and I know it's just not male, female, black, white, I mean, there's, there's so many different elements to full spectrum diversity. But if you don't start thinking about the sort of the, the, the male perspective, there's a challenge. In, that in, the, in society, you tend to have a group called insiders and outsiders. Hmm. If you think about the, the corporate world, insiders tend to be made up predominantly of, of men. And they have often the power to make decisions. However, they may not be aware or be able to see some of the things that need to be addressed. Whereas when you look at the minority groups, which are tend to be referred to in the, in the term sort of outsiders in this analogy, they often see what needs to change, but sometimes lack the power to be able to do it. Yeah. So for me, <clears throat> being part of the diversity organization, and in fact, moving into leading a diversity organization, it allowed me to start to look at the diversity, um, <clears throat> the whole broad spectrum of diversity through a male lens. And that, I think, is an interesting point that, that, that is worth us discussing today. Yeah. So say more about that, say more about the Men for, the men for Inclusion organisation that you set up. You know, what did it stem from? What was its purpose? And what, what um, outcomes did you see? What impact did it have? So it's a, it's, it's, a good, um, it's a good question because this is something that, you know, I was really passionate about um, and I felt really did make a, a difference. Mm. And that is because... What the Men for Inclusion organization did is they partnered with all the diverse groups within the organization. So they partnered with various different groups, um, connected black professionals, connected women, connected veterans, connected Latinos, and, and many others, and Pride and, and other organizations. And what they became is it became a conduit to bring the voice of all those different minorities to the main stage. So, for example, like I said before, I didn't really know what it was like, say, to be a woman or to be black or, as I've said already, when I attended some events where my male peers in America, I remember this, um, this one day, I was invited to attend a Connected Black Professionals event. 
And I remember getting as far as the door and going to open the door and then going, what if I open the door and I'm the only white guy in the room? What if I open the door and everyone stops and looks at me and says, hey, I think you've got the, the wrong meeting, you know? So I didn't even go in. Even though I was invited, I didn't go in. I mean, how ridiculous is that? I mean, how, how contra to diversity is that? Yeah. And then the subsequent meeting I went and I, I sat there opposite um, an African-American colleague, same grade, same level as me in the organization. And he talked about driving to work that day. And he said, look, I was driving to work. Um, there'd recently been some shootings and, you know, an African-American was shot, you know, he was pulled over for something. He was shot, you know, and it was, it was an absolute travesty. And he said, I was driving to work and I thought, ah, I better not speed today because what if I get shot? Wow. And I was sat yeah. there, Amanda, thinking, I've never driven to work thinking I better not speed because I might get shot. I might lose my life. I mean, that, that thought, that concept, totally alien to me. Just, just totally didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. Or he went on to say that if he left work in his suit and his tie and went to the store, you know, he could shop and everything be fine. But on a Saturday, he got the same store in a tracksuit and a hood and the security would follow him around. I don't think I've ever been to a store and security's followed me around. Now, again, I'm not saying that's every situation, but it made me aware that it's not the same. Depending on the situation, depending on the individual, it is different. And so Men for Inclusion was really a group targeted towards helping uh, and focusing on all those individual minority groups and giving them a main stage voice so that, that men could actually go, well, I, I didn't know that, just like me. I didn't know things and I learned them. It's like, well, how, how can we share those experience and stories with, um, with other men? And that's really what yeah. gave, uh, gave, I guess, momentum to that, that organization. That's a really powerful story. You know, when you're talking about standing at the door and not sure whether to go through, it's another experience that you wouldn't have ever experienced before the first time. Yeah. Whereas for others, that's something that, you know, is, a, is an experience that is often um, experienced. <laughs> so experience I mean, to that point, you, know, <laughs> you think about organisations, yeah. they, they might say, right, today is a pride day. You know, we're going to celebrate pride together or today is um, International Women's Day. We're going to create an event today targeted at the women. Men generally wouldn't just suddenly go, oh, I'm going to go to that. Because A, they'd think, well, am I invited? B, what if I get there and I'm the only man there? Which, again, isn't a bad thing. I'm no. sure there are many minority people that said, well, hey, welcome, welcome to my world. You know, I've often been the only person there in, in a certain minority group. So it's not just about creating a pride day or an international women's day or whatever day, because men generally aren't just going to feel that a they're invited or b that they should attend or there's anything for them to learn if they do attend. So it, it's going to take more than just creating events to change. I think how a lot of men view mm. diversity, not because they have a negative lens on it. They just don't necessarily see just like I didn't some of the things that, that happen so yeah so what else could could organizations do you know large or small i guess that could help to um you know create a culture for 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 inclusiveness and create an environment or or, or um, you know encourage an open dialogue such as what we're having today um and, and involve others in the dialogue and and start being more open I think an inclusive culture, it absolutely stems from leadership. And again, I've been fortunate enough to work for some incredible companies in my mm. career. And when you look at it from the top down, the bigger the company, the harder it is, if you think about it. You know, the more people that work there, the more tiers of leadership. You know, how do you get that message, that unified culture, that unified set of values to go throughout the company? And I remember a day not that long ago, where a chief people officer for one of these organizations, they basically said, look, um, on our call today, and it was like a, an all hands, everybody in the organization attended this call. They said, we're gonna to share today some of the statistics that we've lodged over the last six months around how many HR cases have been raised. And they said, in the last six months, there's been 200 plus cases raised. We've investigated 100 of those already, 
And of those 100 we've investigated, and it talked about the categories, you know, uh, bullying, you know, inappropriate behavior, and there's a number of categories. And it said, we've investigated 100 of these cases so far and concluded the investigation. 40% of people have had disciplinary action taken against them. 25% of people are no longer in the organization. I remember sat there in that sort of company-wide meeting, and it never heard these statistics. I mean, nobody ever really talks about these statistics. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, they're serious about this. This is not some kind of, yeah, everybody, you know, get on, get your rosette for diversity. It's good for the company. Yeah. And then, you know, everyone puts the phone down and goes back to normal. This was this, this behavior. If that's how you behave. Yeah. It had consequences. It's, yeah. it's not tolerated. Yeah. And I remember even hearing people in the, the water cooler and the corridors talking about, wow, I can't believe they went public. And even the, the chief people officer went as far to say is 200 cases in six months. Good. Nobody knows. No companies ever share that information. And what I take from that as one tip, one piece of advice is tabling the conversation, you know, having the conversation leading by example is so important Yeah. because it's easy to say the company values are inclusive or well, show me how is it inclusive? You know, that's where I think, you know, great companies oh. put it at the forefront. Like you, when you table the elephant in the room saying, Hey, Phil, you kind of a bit of a middle-aged white guy. What do you know about diversity? You should do that, right? And yeah. obviously in an appropriate way, but you should do that and encourage you to lead by example because only then will the culture that you want to be become actually a real culture that people embody. So over the last three or three, four months, of course, we've had the COVID-19 and also, you know, the Black Lives Matter, both incidents that have, you know, shifted the world on its on its axis quite a bit and and um you know coming through that i'm not saying coming out of it because i think these are lasting lasting impacts but you know what are your perspectives about around how companies and, and individuals are reacting and what can they do moving yeah. forward you know what advice could you give yeah. let's start with with, with covid19 i mean it's unrealistic to think anybody hasn't been affected in some way i mean it's, it's mm. changed so much for so many um the one thing i would say is the, the fear that i have and i think the fear of some others is that some of the the um, progress that's been made from a diversity standpoint in organizations becoming more diverse workforce i think there is a risk in that, for example, when companies may be choosing to downsize or, right. or to, to redefine what they do next, are the leaders of those companies going, right, okay, we need to reduce the company size by 20% and we need to focus on these new lines of business. At that point, are they thinking, how do we ensure we've got the right diverse organization to, to lead and, and, and drive that, that new vision? And how do you ensure that the 20% of people that perhaps whose roles are no longer required. Are you looking at that through a lens of diversity? I think the statistics that have already been gathered, particularly in the US, have shown that statistically right now, minority groups have seen a, a higher increase in um, redundancies and job losses than you know, traditional sort of white males in the population. So there is a risk, I think, that companies might go, yes, diversity, diversity, hold on a second. We've got all this other stuff, COVID-19. Let's just deal with this. And then when we've done it, we'll go back to diversity. Right, yeah. This should be part of the diversity conversation. Ensure you have a diverse leadership team making decisions on what your company does next. Because every metric, every statistic shows your company is six times more successful. The results will be three times greater when you have a diverse workforce and a diverse leadership team. So do not take your eye off, off that when you're thinking about how do you restructure and what the new strategy is moving forward on the flip side though i think as lots of people work from home you could say well maybe people are more equal you know people are all at home together but again statistics have shown that uh, in the uk that 68 um, percent of homes where where both in in a couple um, the women is more likely to be responsible or, or actively being the main person in the family that's dealing with certain things or looking after the children versus males in the household. So, you know, there are still differences in, in diversity, even if we're all sat working from home, it feels different for people. Don't get me on that, Phil. 
Did you see? Did you see the uh, in the news this week? The the newsreader on the BBC and the child came in the door behind her and said, "Mummy, can I have some chocolate biscuits?" <laughs> and, and again, you know what I would say to there's more tolerance for that now. I think embrace you know, exactly. it. You bring that child on your knee and say, "Hey, why don't you say hello to everybody watching the BBC?" You know, <laughs> this is my son, and he wants to join. Go and have two chocolate biscuits, and Mummy, be back in a minute. Yeah. You know. I used to sit here, and this is one of the, the things I regret in my early career as an exec, when my children would come home from school and they want to show me something. Oh, and yeah. I'd be there slightly off camera, but just doing this. You know, daddy's on a call, do this. That's not how mm. you embrace, you know. It's a really the world. powerful living, right? image. People have lives and companies are more, tolerant sounds the wrong word, but more embracing of that than I've ever seen. So. If your children come in, your children come in, right? I mean, it wasn't the end of the world for the newsreader, and I'm, I'm sure you know it's it's. It Everyone be something found it funny. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So one final thing, um, Phil, because oh, go on. Yeah. Sorry, the last point, yeah. very important. We you asked me about COVID nineteen and Black Lives Black, Matter. Yes, I mean, thank you. Just just very briefly, I think the Black Lives Matter movement has made some very different changes than I've ever seen in the corporate world. Corporate leaders spent a number of years, don't mention politics, don't mention religion, don't mean, you know, there's lots of things you don't mention because clearly your workforce, some are gonna agree with you and some are not. So companies and CEOs often would never sort of speak publicly about mm. supporting or, or not supporting a, a movement. Whereas for Black Lives Matter, I mean, the world has embraced this unlike um things i've seen in the past so mm -hmm. i think <clears throat> the momentum and the fact that so many leaders have said publicly you know we do not tolerate racism yeah. we have an inclusive culture i think that if that can can maintain being at the forefront something that is spoken about not something that people don't talk about but something that is spoken about i think that 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 is different to what i've seen in the past so uh, it, it would, be, it would be good to see how that movement continues. Continues to go. if that momentum stays up. Yeah, absolutely. So what advice would you give to individuals, or, uh, diverse individuals, well, all individuals really, who want to further their career? Um, I know you've got a particular recommendation. Um, tell us about that. Yes. Yeah. One of the things that uh, I often got asked, particularly when working with um, different groups. Yeah was, well, look, you know, I feel like I've been stuck in my career for, for this period and I want to move to that next level or I want to move into senior leadership. You know, what, what tips can you give? And when I look at my own career and then I look at some of the, the people that I've worked with, one of the things that became very paramount is that sponsorship is so important as you drive your career, particularly into management and senior management. Yeah. And I was amazed to see, read a statistic that actually just looking at male, female sponsorship, that men on average have four times more sponsors than women. Wow. And that really blew me away. Now, why that is, um, I'm sure there are many reasons and there's probably different studies, but just the sheer fact that men had four times more sponsorship, I think does drive more of an opportunity for them to move into senior leadership positions. I think when you're in early in your career, you tend to get promoted for doing good things, you do a good job and you sort of move up the, the scale. But when you start moving into some more senior leadership roles, it's about other senior leaders sponsoring you. Mm -hmm. And if you're not sure what a sponsor is, it's the person who's going to talk about you when you're not there. The person in the room will say, yes, do you know what? that is a great individual. They are top talent. I really think that they're ready for the next level. So I do encourage you all to leverage your network. And if your network isn't as big as you'd like it to be, look for opportunities to expand your network because getting the right level of sponsorship will not only help guide your career, but it will also be really important as you start to move into more senior leadership roles. Wonderful. Wonderful. And um, I should have turned my phone off right at the beginning, but there you go. That's a one, maybe that was our cue. And that was an excellent, uh, excellent recommendation. I think having somebody in the organization that can clear the path, you know, for you and be your agent, almost promoting you, advocating you and putting you in a position where your talents 
and your strengths can be seen is uh, a wonderful piece of advice. And Phil, thank you so much for being um, able to have a, a wonderfully bold conversation. I, I feel liberated, you know, to, to, to continue conversations ongoing and I'm sure that you've had the same impact on people watching this as well. It's been a real pleasure. And thank you very much. And I and I think just to just to leave you with this, you know, when some people say, oh well, <laughs> you know, you, you ran an organization like men who get it, you know, what do you mean? It's not men who get it, Amanda. I think it's men who want to get it. Yeah. yeah. And that's that's I think how I'll leave it. Very nice. Wonderful. Well I wish you all the best, Phil. And thank you for sharing your wisdom and insight with us today. And uh, yeah, wonderful. Okay. Good luck with all of your new venture with 30,000 days. I know it's not luck, it's sheer hard work. So all the best with that. All right, you take care. Thank you. Take care. Thanks again. Bye. Bye. So an inspiring perspective there from Phil uh, about diversity. So what came through for me was that it's so important now to update our thoughts and our actions. So let's summarize some of the key takeaways from the discussion. Connecting diverse groups do, does drive results and retains talent. And it's about creating an understanding of each other's uh, perspective. 70% of US men in corporate roles do not feel part of diversity. Interesting point there. Um, there is a certain amount of uncertainty about how men can, can get involved. So doing some work around that. Think top down for an inclusive culture. So this really stems from leadership with the unified, uh, unified values and structure. And really useful insight here is that companies are six times more likely to be successful with a diverse workforce. In terms of mindsets, um, we we'll all look at diversity through our own unique lens, so being open to learn about others' experiences. Be proactive at connecting versus saying nothing. And ask how to get involved. Table it, openly discuss diversity and inclusion and making it real for people, I think, is what I heard Phil saying. In terms of challenges coming up, uh, you know, this, this concept of down, not concept, but, you know, the prospect of downsizing. Yeah, are we looking through the lens of diversity as we do that? And diversity, inclusion, diversity and inclusion for remote workers more and more people now working from home. So how can you go about keeping and making those connections uh, more sustainable? Challenging traditional thinking. So this is about what, what do, does diverse teams look like today? And then uh, questioning where the power is, you know, who are the insiders, who are the outsiders? And then finally, opportunities. Certainly, um, Phil talked about career development uh, and leadership development, that men on average have four times more sponsors than women. So it's important to uh, proactively seek sponsors. Leading the discussion about inclusion and including it in the dialogue with teams, inviting diverse thoughts and, and ideas. And one of the most powerful things I heard Phil talk about was how uh, organisations can address and share results. So those incidents that do not sit or fit with an inclusive culture need to be addressed. So um, thank you very much. That's the end of our insight series. And it was a great way to close out the discussions by talking with Phil about diversity. So thank you very much. And I look forward to your feedback.